The only people who don't want to disclose the truth are people with something to hide. Good morning, everybody. I am Joseph Ferrer from WND.com, and uh, we're going to be talking, uh, as billed, uh, very shortly about the lawsuit that you all want to hear about, the lawsuit uh, against Esquire. Uh, but uh, before we get there, I want to uh, bring a couple of people forward to provide some background very important background, I think, uh, to that lawsuit. Uh, there is a very significant development in the very story for which Esquire was ridiculing uh, WND uh, and uh, defaming WND. And so I'd like to introduce, uh, to start, uh, Jerome Corsi, the author of the book, Where's the Birth Certificate? senior staff writer uh, for WND uh, to uh, fill us in on those details. Uh, thanks, Joseph. And I'm the author of uh, Where's the Birth Certificate? This is the um, book that we published uh, on May 17th, and I want to give you some of the background. I think the background here is important in understanding the lawsuit. Uh, when the book came out, prior to it, Joseph and I had been in discussions as to whether or not we wanted to change the title. Well, the title should have been, this is way before it was published. This goes back almost six months to something like uh, ineligible for command on something of that nature. Um, but we decided that basically we wanted to keep the title the same because the issue was could we really force the release of a birth certificate from the White House. And then in early February, I got notified, I have one of my really top intelligence sources in Hawaii uh, told us that a person we've had in the Department of Health in Hawaii who's been a mole to us, giving us information, said that the birth certificate had been forged and was now in the logbook prior to uh, this, the birth certificate didn't exist. When Governor Abercrombie made the search for the long-form birth certificate, he was not able to discover it, just found notations in the file. And Joseph and I went back again and said, well, shall we again change the title of the book? And the argument was, no, we'll keep it exactly at where's the birth certificate, because the birth certificate that's going to be released is likely to be a forged document. And if we can force that, we might suffer some public relations setback. People say, oh, where's the birth certificate? It's here on the White House website. Ha ha. I said, but if they do that, it's in fact not really understanding that that birth certificate needs to be subjected to forensic examination. And if we could force the release of a fraudulent birth certificate, everything changed. And in fact, it did. On April 27th, when President Obama came forward into the press room and said, this is my birth certificate, suddenly the President is now on the chain of evidence. It's no longer possible to say, one of my subordinates or someone not associated with me produced the short form certificate of live birth. I'm not responsible for it. No, you've got now the President of the United States saying, this is my birth certificate. And with the release of that document, the entire future of the Obama presidency depends on the authenticity of the document. And with a year and a half left in the presidency, Senator Joseph, I think we'll be able to have the book established as a bestseller. And the book became a New York Times bestseller, despite the efforts of groups like Esquire to kill the book. And I remain absolutely confident that the reason the Obama administration was forced into the release of this fraudulent birth certificate was to try to prevent the publication of the book. That was a key element, I believe, in the decision to suddenly produce a document that hadn't existed for three and a half years. If this birth certificate existed three and a half years ago instead of 20 minutes ago, why didn't the White House release it? 
when it was first requested in 2008. Instead of having to go through all this discussion and explanation about the Hawaii Department of Health won't get long-form birth certificates released, we have copies of long-form birth certificates released by the Hawaii Department of Health a month before, through the end of March 2011. The issue that the Hawaii Department would not release those documents is a lie. We have proof that they were releasing the documents to people who paid the fee and followed the Hawaii law, which has not yet been changed, that allows people access to their vital records. So when we had the release of this forgered, for, forgery, this, this fraudulent document, everything changed. Now, in fact, you've got a document the president is responsible for, one that needs to be in, have it undergo a forensic examination to determine if, it, if it's a forgery or not. And just from the prima facie looking at it, you'd say, well, if the White House was really determined to convince the American public that the long-form birth certificate was legitimate, any court in the world would have demanded the best evidence of the document, which is the document itself. And the original long-form birth certificate, if it exists, has not been released by the Hawaii Department of Health. It's still being covered up. It's still being held in the vault. It's still being shown to no one. We have no corroboration from the Kapiolani Hospital of the patient records of Ann Dunham. We have no confirmation from the patient records of Dr. Sinclair that he actually delivered the baby. All of these records, again, remain under seal as part of a continuing cover-up. And if you read Where's the Birth Certificate, as I think now thousands of Americans are, the book documents and demonstrates, first of all, there are more eligibility questions that have not been examined than just where Obama was born. Obama was born on the steps of the White House. His father was Kenyan, which means at birth Obama was a dual citizen of the Commonwealth of Great Britain and of the United States, with Kenya having been a Commonwealth country. A dual citizen is not in the definition of a natural born citizen, which I think gets supporting evidence from the continuing the Senate resolution to uh, 511 that was passed for John McCain, which specified McCain had two U.S. citizen parents at birth. Barack Obama co-sponsored that resolution and knew he could not meet its criteria did not submit, Barack Obama did not submit his birth credentials to the Senate for an equal examination. In fact, in the 125 exhibits in this book, the second from last is a Congressional Research Service report that documents Obama never submitted his birth credentials to any government agency. It's a loophole in the Constitution. Constitution Article 2, Section 1 requires a president to be a natural born citizen, but yet the Constitution does not empower any group or institution of government to be responsible for checking birth credentials of presidential candidates. And a major argument in this book is not only that we lack more documents on President Obama than any other modern president. We don't have his education records. Don't even have his grades going back to kindergarten. Or whether he's registered in any of these schools as a foreign student. We don't have from Barack Obama whether or not Barack Obama was adopted in Indonesia or functioned as a dual citizen in Indonesia. His mother's passport records and Dunham indicate that she removed Barack Obama from her passport and said Barack Obama soy barca. School records say Barack Obama is registered as Barry Satoro. Under all these examinations, I think what we find is that the book has presented arguments which have remained valid and have become a bestseller despite the efforts to kill the book. And a critical argument of the ridicule, a critical argument that Esquire was advancing, was that the book 
you know, was saying, oh, well, now World Net Daily has doubled down, saying it's a forgery. And I think that's where we want today to begin, which is the evidence that, in fact, the birth certificate released by Barack Obama, a PDF electronic file, and then some Xerox copies, is a forgery. To advance that argument, we've been publishing a series of analyses in World Net Daily, and we have today with us an expert, Mara Zebest. Mara has authored or been contributing editor, managing editor, on over 100 books dealing with Adobe and Microsoft software. And with that, Mara is going to take us through the analysis of her study, which has been published in World Net Daily. It's available today. And uh, Mara will give us the main points of her conclusion uh, that the document is a forged document. Mara? As Jerome Corsi said, my name is Mara Zabist. I am a teacher of Adobe um, programs and Microsoft programs for government uh, employees as well as uh, many fi Fortune 500 companies. I also co-author and I'm a technical editor for over 100 books. Uh, a dozen of those are for Adobe programs. Um, I came to look at this birth certificate on the day that it was uh, released from a friend of mine. I have many friends who rely on me for my expertise. Uh, I can't tell you how many times people call me up and they, in this case too, they just said, if anybody can tell if it's real or fake, I know it'd be you, you'd have to look at it and tell me what you see. I went to the White House uh, white, uh, website, I downloaded the file I opened it up in Illustrator, and the reason I opened up in Illustrator is because I know that if it's a PDF, it's going to, uh, Illustrator is still going to retain a lot of the information. And so I opened it up in Illustrator to see what I could find. Within seconds, this is not only a fake document, it is an obvious fake document. It was just unbelievable. I. I was just in shock that what I was looking at. Um, it, this document is just impossible, impossible that it could be authentic. And I can show you why. Um, if we open up this document, just to show you, I, if I get info too, this document was, uh, well, I thought maybe it showed where I downloaded it from, but it doesn't. If we open this document up in Illustrator, oh, this is the report. Do you not have the document on yes. here? That's why it was looked like it was created. Because I see this is the report too. When you open this document up in Illustrator, first you have this links palette here, which shows multiple links. 
that is not normal for a normal document. If this document had been scanned into a computer, as the White House says it has been, you would only see one flat layer and one link. If we look at the layers palette here, we see multiple layers. That is not normal for a normal document. If you take a picture and you scan it in, or a document and you scan it in, you should only see one layer. It's a flat image. On these layers, if you <clears throat> take a look at any one of these, these there's these little eye icons next to it. You can click on them and you can turn them on and off and see which layer goes to it. Uh, this is the text. This is the stamp. This is the date. This is part of a date. This is another date. This document has obviously been manufactured digitally. This is not a scan. If you take any one of these objects, I'll take the stamp here, you can move it. When do you scan in any document and be able to just move pieces from it? When you scan in something, it's a picture. You cannot move pieces from it unless it's an edited document and it's been manufactured. This is not normal. I have heard uh, people say that this happens if you scan in with OCR. This is not an OCR document either. The, there are so many inconsistencies with this document. If you zoom in, look at the differences in text. And this isn't just in, by the way, this, lead, this number here is one of these layers. Uh, let me see which one it is. Well, these numbers here, when you're looking at this, you have an inconsistency of what I refer to as noise. When you scan in a document, you're going to have a consistency of pixelation, noise, whatever you want to talk. You can see that a little bit in this one here, which means it could have come from another document scanned, not necessarily this was scanned in with something here, which is what I think happened. Uh, you also have it in combination with letters here that look very jagged edge bitmap. There's a difference in color. Um, same sort of thing if you move down to any part of this document. Uh, there's boxes here, you can see these two boxes here. This box has the bitmap black X, this one has the pixelated X. You can see letters up here that are pixelated but letters next to it are bitmap which indicate that when they adjusted this box with the X they had to adjust the letters that were nearby too. Um, if you scan down further here You have a difference, you don't have the bitmap and the, the noise mixed together, but you do have a difference in color. That color usually occurs when somebody thinks it looks black on the screen, but when they print it to PDF, it doesn't print as a pure black. So somebody made a lot of errors here. Um, and as I said, I mean, I can only just reiterate it again. This is just not a fake, it's an obvious fake. I have not found anybody I know that I work with in my industry that have looked at this and can explain this other than this is an edited document. That's pretty much all I have to say here, I guess. And we're going to have time for questions and answers for Jerry and Mara. Uh, I know you do, we do want to get to the lawsuit, but I want everybody here to think about the, the ramifications of what Mara has just showed us that the birth certificate <laughs> issued by the White House in April is clearly fraudulent. Uh, you know, 
and she's not the only expert saying this. In fact, every expert we have consulted has said the same thing. I want to make this point, too. Not one news media institution in this country has found a qualified expert of Mara's caliber to affirm that this birth certificate is real. And that's astonishing, because if the press has gotten to the point in this country where we just accept whatever handouts the uh, government provides to us and, and take them at face value, we're, we're all in a lot of trouble. We never would have uncovered Watergate with that kind of attitude. Um, so with that, I would like to transition here to talk about the uh, Esquire lawsuit. And I want to introduce the very distinguished attorney and my dear friend Larry Klayman to tell us all about it. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. <clears throat> We live in the real world today, unfortunately, where people practice the politics of personal destruction, a phrase that's been used by many on all sides of the political spectrum. Sometimes in the media, people get personally involved in an issue. This has been a very controversial issue, the birther issue. And one would expect that a magazine such as Esquire and its reporter, Mark Warren, which have a distinguished record historically, would have reported this issue with regard to the book by Mr. Corsi and World Net Daily Books and Mr. Farah's involvement accurately. But the reporter got personally involved and he made some statements which were very damaging, not just to the organizations, World Net Daily Books, WorldNetDaily.com, but to the individuals involved, Mr. Farah and Mr. Corsi. It was amateurish, it was rank. It hurt. And what occurred was that on the morning of May 18th at 10 a.m., a article was published in Esquire stating, breaking Jerome Corsi's birther book pulled from the shelves. There was nothing stated about satire. We all know that when there's satire, whether it was Mad Magazine in the, in the past or in the present, usually it's identified as satire. And what was published was starkingly real to the reader. And let me read you just a portion of that, which is in the complaint, which is actionable, and I'll tell you why it's actionable, and why this was a serious mistake by Mark Warren and Esquire, for which they will pay dearly. Quote, in a stunning development one day after the release of Where's the Birth Certificate, the case that Barack Hussein Obama is not eligible to be president, by Dr. Jerome Corsi, WorldNet Daily editor and chief executive officer Joseph Farah, has announced plans to recall and pulp the entire 200,000 first print run of the book, as well as announcing an offer to refund the purchase price to anyone who has already brought, bought either a hard copy or electronic download of the book. In an exclusive interview, a reflective Farah, who wrote the book's foreword, and also published Corsi's earlier book, Selling Work, Unfit for Command, Swift Boat Veterans Speak Out Against John Kerry, and Capricorn One, NASA, JFK, and the great moon landing cover-up, said that after much serious reflection, he could not go forward with the project. I believe, this is a quote of Mr. Farah, which is attributed to him, I believe with all my heart that Barack Obama is destroying the country, and I will continue to stand against his administration at every turn. But in light of recent events, this book has become problematic and contains what I now believe to be factual inaccuracies, he said this morning. Quote, I cannot in good conscience publish it and expect anyone to believe it. When asked if he had any plans to publish a corrected version of the book, he said cryptically, quote, there is no book, unquote. Farrah declined to comment on the discussions of the matter with Corsi. A source at World Net Daily, who requested that his name be withheld, said that Farrah was rip shit when on April 27th, President Obama took the extraordinary step of personally releasing his long-form birth certificate, thus resolving the matter of Obama's legitimacy for anyone with a brain. <clears throat> he called upon Corsi and really tore him a new one, says the source. Quote, I mean, we'll do anything to hurt Obama and erase his memory 
but we don't want to look like fucking idiots, you know. Look, at the end of the day, bullshit is bullshit. Quote, unquote. Corsi, who graduated from Harvard and is a professional journalist, could not be reached for comment. Now, where in our right mind and in our entire lives, and i got to tell you, I've seen a lot, I've brought many defamation cases and other types of cases on both sides. I've never seen something that was totally fabricated. No one ever spoke with Mr. Farah. He never made those comments. This was completely manufactured and false. And it was obviously calculated with malice to destroy not just the book and its sales, but to destroy the reputations of Mr. Sorcy and Mr. Corsi and Mr. Farah. The stupidity of this is beyond belief. The legal actionability of this is believable. The reason that these things happen in Washington, as I was said, and in New York and in, in the press world, is because people take things personally. Things should be published in a non-personal way. And after this was called into question, this obviously fabricated story, and after it was made known that World Net Daily and the other plaintiffs here may pursue legal action, a so-called disclaimer was issued the same day by Esquire and Mark Warren. But it was not a disclaimer at all. In fact, it was intended again with malice, maliciously, to harm Mr. Farah and Mr. Corsi, as well as their organizations. And in this so-called disclaimer, Warren states, this is quoting him, for those who didn't figure it out yet, and the many on Twitter for whom it took a while, we committed satire this morning. Isn't that ironic to us? We committed satires, like we committed a crime. To point out that the problems with selling and marketing a book that has had its core premise and reason to exist gutted by the news cycle several weeks in advance of publication. Are its author and publisher chastened? Well, no. They double down and accuse the President of the United States of perpetrating a fraud on the world by having released a forged birth certificate. Not because this claim is in any way based on reality, but to hold their terribly gullible audience captive to their lies, to sell books. This is despicable and deserves only ridicule. That's a very important phrase. I'm going to explain that just in a second. That's why we committed satire in the matter of the Corsi book. Hell, even the president has a sense of humor about it all. Some more serious reporting from us on the whole birther phenomenon here, here, here. Then, in a comment that was made to the Daily Caller later, after all of this was published, Mr. Corsi, and this is at paragraph 15 of our complaint, and you all have a copy, called Mr. Corsi, and by extension the other plaintiffs, an execrable piece of shit. This is an organization, First Communications and Esquire, which should be above the actions of Mr. Warren. It's surprising that at this point, Mr. Warren has not been disciplined, but he will be disciplined in the context of this case with large damages because this did some real harm. The fact is, is the book is sold, and I'm not going to give testimony right now, I'm talking as a lawyer, but it hasn't nearly sold as well as it would have sold if the damage had not been done by Esquire and Warren, because immediately after this came out, World Net Daily Books and Mr. Farah and Mr. Corsi and others received a number of communications where distributors, booksellers, and others believed that the book was being pulled from the shelf, believed that Mr. Farah was going to rip one for Mr. Corsi. It destroys his reputation. So therefore, we have brought a multi-count complaint, a complaint for defamation, and even if uh, the plaintiffs in this case are considered to be public figures, clearly there were admissions that this was malicious. The admissions that Mr. Corsi was an equitable piece of shit, and by extension the other plaintiffs, the statements that they should be held out for ridicule in the community. And in the District of Columbia, where this case is brought, there's another tort, that means a wrong in French and in our legal system, a civil wrong, called false light. And when you hold an individual or individuals out outrageously for ridicule in the community, and this is a community here in D.C. of the media and elsewhere throughout the United States, the statements can even be true. But if they're intended to cause harm, to cause ridicule, then as lawyers say, they're actionable. Mr. Warren has admitted unbelievably, stupidly, that he intended to hold Mr. Farrer and Mr. Corsi out to ridicule. So we have brought this case under a false light theory as well as a defamation theory. 
In addition, invasion of privacy, another tort in the District of Columbia. And that's when you take someone's name and use his name without authorization and use it in a way which is misleading and deceptive, which aggravates what you did. Even just the first aspect legally is actionable. But when you do it deceptively, then it's intended to harm him. In this case, false quotes were taken of Mr. Farrow, false motives were taken of Mr. Corsi, and there is a violation of invasion of privacy. In addition, we have a count in this complaint under the Lanham Act for false advertising. Esquire admits, particularly in the disclaimer, that they report on the birth or issue. They like the fact that Mr. Farrow, World Net Daily, World Net Daily Books, and Mr. Corsi are out there talking about the birther issue because then they get to take the other side of the story and they get advertising revenues from their circulation, etc. Well, by stating facts that were false that were manufactured, this constitutes false advertising under the Lanham Act, the second part of the Lanham Act, as we plead in the complaint. And the damages are very onerous. We don't have to prove any damage to the plaintiffs, to ourselves, so that we can certainly show that and will show that significant damage here, not just actual, but punitive damage. But all we have to show under the Lanham Act are the advertising revenues, the net revenues of Esquire uh, with regard to its magazine and its false advertising. And they're, they're huge. The damages could run in the tens of millions, if not millions of dollars. We have not pled that amount in the complaint. We've kept it very modest. But the jury will get to decide, this is a jury case, what those damages will be. And those damages are trebled on the Lanham Act, plus attorney's fees. So the bottom line is this, is that neither Mr. Farron nor Mr. Corsi, or World Net Daily Books, or World Net Daily, wished to engage Esquire or Mark Warren or Hearst Corporation on any of these issues. They were forced into this. They believe in freedom of the press. They believe in letting people give their opinion and letting those opinions be decided in the, in the uh, court of public opinion, not in the court of law. But we had no choice but to bring this case. And by bringing this case, we're actually upholding principles of freedom of speech, not seeking to restrict it, but to uphold those principles. Because if a reporter like Warren, and if a magazine like Esquire and its parent, Hearst Communications, Inc., are allowed to do this to people in this country, and to destroy them, to try to destroy them, and to actually harm them, then that is an abridgment of free speech, because we should encourage speech in this country. We should not seek to stifle it. So I hope that you all will take a look at this complaint, judge it on the merits, judge it on the legal basis. But it's very strong that in my entire history of being a lawyer, and I've been a lawyer for many years, and been involved in these kinds of cases, and I can make no predictions. But from my own personal opinion, this is one of the strongest cases of defamation, false light, false advertising, invasion of privacy I've ever seen. And I am very surprised and shocked that Hearst Corporation has not come forward uh, to Mr. Farrow and Mr. Corsi on this issue to seek to resolve it. So we had no choice but to bring this lawsuit. Thank you. Stay up there, Larry. We've got some um, Mara and uh, Jerome, why don't you come up uh, and we can field questions on, on both presentations at, at the same time. I, I do want to add um, uh, something about uh, Mara, who I've just met in the last couple of days. Um, uh, Mara is a lifelong Democrat. Um, in 2008, she was a Hillary supporter. And I think that that is uh, worth pointing out. Uh, because uh, so much of this story uh, has been mischaracterized uh, with regard to, you know, well, is it all politically motivated? Uh, you know, we did not make up what you saw demonstrated here today. We did not manufacture that document that you saw on the screen today. Somebody at the White House did. And that's what she has demonstrated. And, and, and frankly, her work has been validated by every single expert we've talked to uh, thus far. And, and by the way, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'd love to hear from some Adobe experts uh, and some document experts who can explain these inconsistencies and uh, anomalies that she has pointed out. 
Anyway, with that, I'll open it up for questions uh, on both issues. I have a couple questions for Mara. Um, I kind of looked into your background, and you have back you seem to have plenty of expertise in Photoshop and Illustrator for Adobe programs. Do you have any experts, Illustrator expertise in Adobe Acrobat or creative PDFs? Yes, I have in most of the Adobe products uh, Illustrator, InDesign, Acrobat, and Photoshop are my major programs that I work with. Okay, and did you, as you know, the original file will state what program the file was created in. Did you look at the first certificate file in the file, in the program that it was created? Yes, and if you just look at it in Acrobat itself, you don't need Illustrator to see that it's fake. You can see it's fake in Acrobat just by knowing the ideas that there's a certain consistency that should be present when you're scanning a document. You have, I, I outline it in my report, uh, explaining the noise, because I understand many people don't understand that. But when you're looking at this document and you see this noise here, okay, this could be from a normal scan. You see this, this the, the letters don't look solid black. You see pixels next to it that don't have complete solid black. But even within these signatures, let me zoom in here. You've got solid black pixelated, bitmapped, next to anti-alazing and, and noise. You, you have a mixture of that within the signatures itself. You don't get that when you scan a document. You can scan a document so that it's bitmap, but the whole document would be bitmap. You're not going to get a mixture. You understand? Does that make sense? I mean, it, it's, it's, you can't look at this and explain it that there's something wrong with my knowledge of these programs. There's something wrong with this document. Um, why did you uh, open up in Illustrator and not Acrobat? Because if I, well, I did open up in Acrobat. I, I looked at it in Acrobat and I saw a lot of anomalies, but I wanted to see if there was something more in this file that I couldn't see in Acrobat. You can't see layers in Acrobat. If it's going to be in there, you, if it's still, if the information is still in the acro, in the PDF file, you can see it in Illustrator, because Illustrator is a vector-based program. I explained that in my report, too. I don't want to get into it too depth, but there's, there's two types of graphic programs. You have a raster-based and you have a vector-based. Photoshop is raster-based, which means pixel-based. If you open it up in Photoshop, you're going to get a completely flat document that is going to be pixel-based. If you open it up in Illustrator, it's still going to be able to read any information in there because it's vector. It deals with math. It understands what's embedded in that program. A question about uh, Jane and Fisher with Bad Week. Um, how many copies were ordered of the book? And how many publishers or, or how many uh, booksellers uh, called after this uh, Esquire report came out uh, to cancel? Um, I don't have exact numbers off the top of my head, but uh, I'm going to suggest that um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 65,000 copies of the book were uh, distributed, printed and distributed. Uh, we, had, we, have, we have definite knowledge of one retail shop actually returning all of its copies of the book. Uh, specifically because of the uh, assumption that the Esquire article was was accurate. Um, and we only found out about that through chance, really. Uh, the way we found out about that, I think it's very instructive. Uh, somebody who wanted to purchase the book, a consumer who wanted to purchase the book, went to that bookstore uh, and when, and he was told that the books had been returned. He went home and he emailed me. Now, I don't know how many consu other consumers did that across the country at other, uh, at other retailers, um, but you know, there's an old saying in, in our business that for every person that writes you, that usually represents <laughs> you know, a hundred or a thousand other people who didn't write to you. That's the way we found out about the one retailer, and, and the situation was actually corrected as a result of that consumer emailing me. Uh, we were able to, I 
can't remember if it was Borders or Barnes and Noble, go to the corporate uh, folks and say, hey, here's what we heard. And they confirmed that the books had been returned and were, were uh, in that situation at least, uh, being sent back to the bookshop. So Barnes and Noble, which, which is it, Barnes and Noble or Borders who can't cancel their orders? It's, you know, we've, we've, uh, we've covered this story in WND, and I wish I, my memory uh, was good enough to recall which of the two. I know it was one of the two major retailers. I can get you that information okay. later. Okay. Well, what is the, uh, the, the dollar amount uh, of the, uh, the grand total here? We, I mean, we've got the defamation, looks like 30 million, false slight, uh, 15 million. I guess I can add them up, but each of these, 30 million for uh, tortious interference. Uh, is this correct? Is that my reading? Is correct? Yes, but uh, when you put forth the damages in each count of the complaint, they're not necessarily cumulative. Mm -hmm. The damage is the damage. So the actual damage, the business damage, will be determined by the jury, right. and you just basically estimate in the complaint. You're not held to that, uh -huh. which is why we pled in excess of. But we're asking for approximately $20 million in actual damages. Let me just quote. It's in the complaint. Oh, ten, ten, ten million dollars in actual damages, twenty million in punitive, and so thirty million in excess of thirty million dollars. Mm -hmm. The reason for punitive damages, generally, a jury will take a look at the net worth of the defendant who's found liable, and determine how much they can assess in punitive damages that will prevent the defendant from ever doing that again. It's punitive. And Hearst Corporation, obviously, with Esquire, is very, very wealthy. So the $20 million estimate is low in terms of what a jury could find. It could, it could wind up in the hundreds of millions of dollars. But in terms of the actual damages, we played in excess of $10 million for the count, counts. And I, and I also might add, with regard to the Lanham Act, the Lanham Act does not look at the actual damages. It looks at the advertising revenues. Mm -hmm. It's you were that week, so that's relevant. Yes. Uh, of Esquire magazine, and those advertising revenues, Esquire will then have an opportunity to show what their net profit was. And if we succeed in our case, and defendants are found liable, then it's trebled by three times on the line of merit plus attorney's fees and costs. Is this, it, does the disclaimer give them any cover uh, after the, uh, it's only no. been, it was only up uh, for a few hours before this disclaimer came out, saying it was satire, and I mean, that would, you know, if their argument, I would assume, covered, they're covered under the First Amendment. They'll try to make that argument. It's not convincing, because if you look at this so-called disclaimer, it's not really a disclaimer. That's why I read it to you. It's actually a way to grind it in. It added insult to injury. It made matters worse. It disparaged Mr. Farah and Mr. Corsi and their organizations and said that they should be held up to ridicule. That's why this issue of malice will not be difficult to prove. Uh, the author admits that he wanted to do a number on the plaintiffs because they're, in his view, obviously bad people. And uh, as a result, this was not a disclaimer. It actually made matters worse because he's calling Mr. Corsi, Mr. Farr, and their organizations liars in this disclaimer. He didn't say this was just simple satire. He said, these people are bad people. They should be held up for ridicule, and they're liars. So he, in fact, reinforced what he had written earlier, which is this book is not accurate, and this book is a fabrication and false. So this is not a disclaimer at all. And it was very, and that's why I say this, it was very stupid to write something like that. He really, Warren and Esquire and, and Hearst, they dug their own graves with that. Now, the original post, Esquire post, was tagged as satire. Well, not prominently, it was tagged as satire. Do you consider that a mitigating factor in this lawsuit? No. No, particularly in light of what was said. And then when the Daily Caller uh, calls Warren for comment, he calls Dr. Corsi an ex piece of shit. I don't think uh, anybody initially looked at that article as satire. Um, I received calls from numerous news organizations within the first hour that that article was posted, and none of them even, there was no hint in their minds 
that this was a parody or satire. They were calling me to find out if it was true. Uh, <laughs> they were calling for comments. And even after the so-called disclaimer was published, the, uh, the, the, uh, the inquiries continued for several days. So, uh, well, you know, would the I, uh, reference to Capricorn One be a major clue that it was a satire? What'd you say? Wouldn't the reference to Capricorn One be a major clue that it was satire? Uh, that you know that would that would be the only hint in there because it you know but when when ev when so much of what the author of the article is saying is untrue, <laughs> you know how do you know when he's intentionally putting something in there that's untrue? that is obviously untrue. I'm looking uh, at the printout here. Where is it, where is it stated that this was satire? It, um, it, in the it, original uh, post, in the uh, tagging, it, it wouldn't be uh, there it, in the print-only version, but in the original form. Yeah, it, 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 it wasn't like obvious to anyone who read the article. It seems like a WordPress blog, uh, uh, WordPress, mm -hmm. and other types of blogging programs um, have a mm -hmm. tag. Have a, Provision for having tags. Uh, we, necessarily we didn't see any satire on it or tagged on it. Uh, secondly, I want to address two points. One, a series of interviews you can document. Uh, the Bob Grant interview on WABC began with Bob Grant asking, assuming the article was true, how badly we've been damaged by the withdrawal of the book. That's the whole premise of the interview. I had several interviews like that, including recently where still the impression is that it was said to be true. In relationship to the Capricorn, you, know, you might say, well, that was an obvious indication, but then you haven't recently read my Wikipedia uh, entry, because you'd have to equally categorize it as satire for the, uh, the lies it tells about my background, which we've been unable to correct. And I can point to many other sources on the Internet which publish in information about me that is just not true. So that in itself was simply an indication of the disdain with which Esquire attempted to hold me in the book. I have a question for Ms. Zivest. The why would how could somebody release a document that you are stating is so amateurish? that it's impossible that it could be authentic. How, how does that happen? I, I, I'm not sure I understand what, how a forger could forge a document that badly. I, 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 can't, I can't speculate on who did the document, on why this happened. All I can say is that from what I'm seeing, whoever put this document together obviously overestimated his abilities. Uh, knew enough to be dangerous, not enough to know how to cover his tracks. Uh, there's, I, I'm, I only touched on a surface of things that are wrong. There's, there's topography errors, there's, you know, the inconsistencies with the time of 1961. Uh, there's inconsistencies in uh, the fact that there's even a background color. There shouldn't be one. You're saying that layering is impossible in a scan document? Correct. It, it, you will have a layer, one. One layer. One layer. It'll be, it'll be a flattened layer. The only time, the only time you have more than one layer is if you've edited the document. And the fact that there's just layers in this document, within seconds after seeing the layers, I, I'm just, I'm, I was shocked. I'm going, oh my god, I can't believe what I'm seeing and how sloppy it is, too. I want to, before just to answer that question, um, my assumption in terms of why the document was so poorly prepared is that uh, the White House scrambled to produce a fraud between the time that uh, Governor Abercrombie could not find the long form document and my book was coming out. So I think this was a panic rush job. Uh, clearly, the White House couldn't put out a request for proposal for qualified forgers to apply here and submit their costs. So it had to be done by a small group that the president trusted, and obviously that group included someone who felt that they were competent on Adobe software, but yet 
as Laura has pointed out, utilize that software in an amateurish fashion to create an apparent and obvious fraud, which was apparent to us in the first hours of looking at it. If I could add one thing, Jerry. Uh, the White House has provided, through the uh, Washington Post, a, a, a timeline of when they decided to act with regard to the birth certificate. And their timeline shows that it was 24 hours after Jerry Corsi's book hit number one on Amazon for the first time. So I think that uh, that speaks to uh, Jerry's uh, answer uh, very directly. Um, I'm sorry, was there another question we interrupted? Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, about the uh, correspondence between Mr. Warren and Hearst uh, after the satire, or after the article came out. Uh, could you tell us what attempts you made to resolve this issue uh, prior to the filing of the lawsuit? Well, I, as the lawyer, did not make any attempts. We were out there, my clients were out there with stories and publications saying that they may bring a long suit, may, which was an invitation for Mr. Warren, Esquire, and Hearst to contact us and say, hey, you know, we did something wrong here. You only have to admit it. Say we'd like to make good on this. We never got any kind of a, a response from them or any kind of a entreaty. So we were forced to bring the case. But we did wait to see whether indeed that would happen, and it didn't. Of okay, course, Mr. Clayman, uh, last year you <coughs> you filed on behalf of Day a lawsuit against the uh, White House Correspondents Association regarding uh, tickets for the. Uh, Correspondence there. Now that was basically uh, dismissed from court rather quickly. How do you think? Do you think you'll fare better on this case? Well, first of all, we decided not to pursue that. But the issue here is this case, not that case. So if you want to relive that case, we'll do it in some other yeah. form. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, yep. Yeah, for Mr. Corsi, um, are you? Did you work at all with uh, Donald Trump in this uh, regard? I mean, he has claimed credit for forcing the White House. Well, Donald Trump called me a number of times and was always curious as to what we were doing. And I constantly advised Donald Trump, uh, including after the birth certificate was released, to um, say uh, openly what we're saying, and that is that the document needs to be submitted to independent forensic testing. And there should be independent corroborating evidence from the hospital and the attending physician, uh, the claims that Obama was born at Kapiolani Hospital and Dr. Sinclair attended the birth. And Mr. Trump uh, didn't advance those arguments very strongly. But he um, did in the course of the conversation say that it, repeatedly uh, that his uh, computer golf expert had told him within the first hours of it being released that in his judgment the document was also a fraud. And Trump indicated to me that he continued to believe that. And uh, all the conversations I had with Donald Trump were, uh, he never once asked them to be off the record, and he's a sophisticated user of media. And so we reported the conversations. Okay, now you've never examined the actual certificate. You've only examined this PDF, right? Well, I'd love to ex examine the actual certificate. If the White House would only allow the Hawaii Department of Health to stop the cover-up and to release the original paper or whatever format the document exists, if it exists a long-form birth certificate, to independent forensic analysis, I'd be thrilled. Excuse me, is, um, is the book any longer relevant? Yes, I think the relevant on several issues. I think we're still asking, where is the real birth certificate? And we're arguing and maintaining that this is a fraud. We've maintained that the book's publication was a precipitating event that uh, tempted the White House into producing a fraud. And what we're arguing now is that the information in the book, on many different bases, indicates that Obama is not eligible to be president, including dual citizen status from birth, from his father being a citizen of Kenya when he was born. And these issues need to be vetted, need to be examined by the American public, will be examined by the American public, I'm confident, before 2012, and an institution of government needs to be put into place so this problem does not occur in the future. Let me add here just one quick thing. Is that 
my client here, Dr. Corsi, is not just any run-of-the-mill author. He's an author who, through his publication of a book with regard to Swift Boats and John Kerry, significantly influenced the election in 2004. He's feared. And for that reason, uh, he's taken seriously. And he's an award-winning journalist, New York Times best-selling author. Uh, that creates the intent, part of the intent, other than the admissions of the defendants themselves, as to the, why they were acting with malice to try to destroy him and everybody in and around him. And I want to say one thing on the relevance of the book. Uh, right now, there's more confusion than ever about what it means to be a natural-born citizen and to be eligible for the presidency of the United States, astonishingly, after all of what's been said and done. And really, the only clarity on this subject is Jerry's book. Uh, yesterday, I saw a Diane, Senator Diane Feinstein letter to a constituent, a constituent who was asking her um, about Obama's eligibility. And her response was that uh, he is eligible because he was born in Hawaii and because of the 14th Amendment. There, if we have that kind of profound misunderstanding about the, what it means to be a natural born citizen at the highest levels of government, the Senate of the United States, we are in a, in a very sad way. And Jerry's book, by the way, is significant not just for what it portends for Obama's presidency, but uh, I'm hoping that it will you know, still stimulate a national debate on this issue of, of uh, eligibility beyond 2012 for the future of this country because we don't want to see the Constitution dumbed down uh, as it is being dumbed down uh, by people like Diane Feinstein right now. Question, has any fact of the book been disputed by either the White House or another news organization and a follow-up another, has any other news organization that you know of um, had uh, any analysis of the document um, yeah, I think that's a very good question. There are two, really two questions there. Number one, <clears throat> uh, on the issue of the birth certificate itself, we, we, we have talked probably to at least a dozen experts at this point, probably more, all of whom are in essential agreement with what Mara Zebes put uh, forth today. Uh, other news agencies, as far as we can see, have, have contacted a total of one <laughs> expert uh, who appeared to affirm the document is real, only to have said he was misquoted, and that was by Fox News, and, and demanded a retraction which has not been extended. In other words, what I'm saying is the news media appears not to have asked a single question to verify the authenticity of this document, which to me is beyond astonishing. And the other part of your question was? Uh, well, has any fact been disputed? Oh, uh, with regard to the book, uh, no. And, and a book like this, which it's, it's almost unbelievable, because Jerry wrote another book that was, several books he, of his have been number one New York Times bestsellers. One of them was Abomination, where the White House actually put out a 40-page Report. The campaign put out a 40-page report of, of, of efforts to contend with factual issues in the book, um, none of which were, in my opinion, significant in any way, shape, or form. But with regard to this book, I haven't seen any facts uh, uh, disputed by anybody in the news media, uh, by the president, by any of his supporters. Factually, the book is apparently, after it's been out for almost three months now, uh, beyond reproach. And, uh, by the way, uh, I'd still invite from the Obama campaign a response to my rebuttal to their 40-page report. <laughs> <laughs> they never did respond to it point by point, and I'm waiting for it. Okay, uh, for Mr. Corsi or Mr. Farah, um, say that no expert you talked to has said that the certificate file is anything other than fake. But there are people who will defend the authenticity of it. For instance, there is a uh, writer on the what's called the Obama conspiracy blog who has issued a detailed rebuttal to uh, Doug's books. Uh, we'll, we'll 
you well, about, how have you reported that? Oh, you're so, talking about Dr. Conspiracy? Yes. Oh, one of my favorites. I'll be writing about Dr. Conspiracy in the next few days. We'll be exposing his background, his entire credentials, his involvement with his company. I've got a detail. I just have not had time to write it up. Why are you attacking these critics so personally by investigating their background? I'm sorry. I said I would, I would evaluate his credentials. It's not a personal attack, but we're going to evaluate his credentials in a discussion of his point by point. His response was to Doug Voigt's? Yes. Yes, and Doug Voigt has partially responded to him. We'll, we'll, we'll debate all of this out in print within the next few days. But will you do it without, without the context of attacking him? Well, as I think I just indicated. Uh, in fact, my rebuttal, if you take a look to my rebuttal, examine that and of the 40-page report that the Obama campaign produced, I thought that was a very level, logical, point-by-point -point argument. I would tend to do the same with what Dr. Conspiracy has produced. Well, we have a question on here. Yeah, I, if you said that all these documents remain under seal. If Hawaii, the Department of Health, has documents on Obama's birth, doesn't that, uh, you know, it, it, can't you infer from that that he was born in Hawaii? Why would they have uh, foreign documents? Uh, uh, Hawaii, for instance, as I point out in the book, issued a birth certificate to Sun Yat-sen, who was the nationalist leader in China. And the, I cite the various statutes in Hawaii that permit the family to register as a Hawaiian birth, a foreign birth. So I think Hawaii uh, has been notorious. Was Sun Yat-sen born in Hawaii? No, he's born in China. He's, he's nationalist. You, you, you can certainly find out who Sun Yat-sen is. I know who he is, but I don't know where he's <laughs> he born. He was born in China. Nationalist leader from China, very famous. He was not born in Hawaii. Hawaii gave him a birth certificate. I have it published in the book. Uh, if Hawaii has any long form birth certificate or whatever records it has uh, to end the cover up, Hawaii should come forward with those records. And in the best evidence basis, it certainly would be required in the court of law. Let me also add, you know, I think it's well known in the community that tries to make government less dishonest. You know, I was the founder of Judicial Watch, Freedom Watch, etc. Hawaii is known for its corruption. Hawaii, Louisiana, Rhode Island. It's not a state that has always been uh, lily white. For Mr. Clayman, um, does the release of this report from Ms. Z Best, Z Best have any effect on the lawsuit? Is, is there any relationship other than the fact that it's Yes, uh, that's an excellent question. Is that Mr. Warren, Esquire, and Hearst, Hearst Communications will probably try to allege that what they said was the truth. Truth is a defense in a defamation case. We are saying that they weren't the truth, they weren't telling the truth because they said that we had lied, that we had falsified facts, that in fact we had pulled books from the shelves, etc. It is very likely that discovery will lead into the White House. And it's very likely that we will, if they raise those defenses, be able to obtain uh, any alleged original birth certificate. Jerry Falwell never had sex with his mother in an outhouse, right? But that was protected under free speech. Why? If those weren't true, true statements. And that was protected. Why, why isn't this protected? It's not protected because this a was done with malice. B, it wasn't so unbelievable as what was said about Jerry Falwell that the reader would come to a different conclusion. This was very much uh, a story which was in its own sick and, in, and dishonest way uh, based on what people could reasonably conclude was reality. And in fact, they did. As Mr. Farrow stating, he got over 65 responses on this. So it's not something fantastic about Jerry Falwell having sex with his mother in an outhouse. If you're going to have sex, you probably wouldn't choose an outhouse. For your mother. For your mother. <laughs> From Ms. Sebest, um, you're saying here that there's obvious cutting and pasting or popping and pasting. Yes, um, there's, there's lots of evidence of that. Uh, how do I get this just started? Yeah. Um, let me just zoom out here. 
as I said, there's um, If you have um, this I, for example, in judicial, is duplicated pixel for pixel. I mean, every pixel that's in this I is exactly the same in this I, which indicates a copy and paste. Same thing for this D. This D, pixel for pixel, is exactly duplicated for this D over here. So my guess is that these were the I's and the D's they used to copy and paste it over here. I'm, it's, it's a guess, but it seems like a reasonable one to make, that there must have been an X in this box, and they needed to cover that up because the X needed to be in the, the yes box, which would also make sense why this X is not bitmapped, it's pixelated, uh, it, along with the text that's surrounding this X. They had to move the X over into this box. So they had to copy the D and the I here because it probably had parts of the X into it. What about this contention about the black on page, well, I'm not sure what page, that there are different kinds of black? Um, there, what happens is when I was trying not to get too complicated because I know that there's time limits on here. But when you have um, certain blacks, there's, there's RGB version of black, which is 000 for all three numbers. And you have CMYK. CMYK gets a little more complicated, and that's for professional printers. You have uh, the K is the black component, which usually is 100% for black. But you can have what's called a rich black, where you have variations, percentages of the other colors mixed in to make the black look just a little bit more richer. And so what happens is RGB, which is what we see on a monitor, that's the color model we always see on a monitor. If that looks black, when it goes to print and when you move this document to make it a PDF, that's like going to print. PDF is, is very similar to sending it to a professional printer. So when you do that, if the mixtures in the CMYK aren't uh, rich, or if the setting is set so that it doesn't see rich black, all of a sudden the blacks don't look as black as they do on the screen. So my guess is that in some of those areas, uh, I think it was down here at the bottom, the dates. Down here in the dates, you can see that you've got the, the differences in blacks here. So this looks like this is, well, not looks, this is one of the layers. This was the layers, and again, the, the really dark black here in the one and the nine, that's on a separate layer, and the light blacks are on a different layer, meaning that that was pieced together too, parts of that date. And I think, what I think happened here was that the person putting this together, it looked black on the screen. He was seeing the RGB version, which was 000. But when it printed to PDF, it didn't print as a pure black or a rich black. And you can't have both in the same document? Not if it's scanned, no. It's going to look consistent. It, it's gonna, if it's black text on a piece of paper, the scanner is going to pick it up and it's going to look black. And even if you make it as a PDF after that, it should look black. And so my final question is, you're saying unequivocally that this is and must be Forgery? It's unequivocally dealed to me. Yes, absolutely. I, I haven't I haven't met any of my colleagues that can say otherwise too. So we're back to square one. Where's the birth certificate, huh, Jerry? Yeah. Uh, unless there are any other questions, uh, we're going to uh, call yes, it. I did one here. more question. Uh -huh. um, this relates to a it's not a related issue. Uh, a couple months ago, Tim Adams, who. Roland Daly is repeatedly cited as a uh, credible source who said, uh, who has said that uh, people in the, uh, or people told his supervisors in the Hawaii Department of Elections told him that 
no birth certificate existed in the uh, state records. He said on the radio show a couple months ago that uh, the affidavit he signed to that effect was supplied by uh, lawyers affiliated with Golden Daily. Is that true? And if so, you why know, haven't you over I, 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 I really don't. Terry, if you want to obsess about stuff like that, I invite you to do so. I, I would really like to focus on why the President of the United States and the White House are issuing bogus birth certificates rather than why somebody at World Net Daily, which lawyer they consulted to do. Well, well if you're creating news to... Yeah, thanks very story. much, Terry. We, we, we all know your work. We're, we're, you're creating we news appreciate all of the attention that you devote to WMD.com. Thanks very much. If it was me, I would resign. How do you do it? Well, we, fortunately, we have help from the media. The only people who don't want to disclose the truth are people with something to hide.